Hello everybody, this is a talk about local problems on trees from two perspectives. One is the perspective of distributed algorithms and the other will be perspective of descriptive combinatorics. So let me start by giving you a short summary what this talk is about. So in computer science, we have this subfield where we study distributed algorithms using some models. One of them is called uh, the local model of distributed computing. In math, there is this sub-area called descriptive combinatorics, where mathematicians study certain infinite constructions that are in, that are in some sense local. Uh, it turns out that there are some pretty cool connections between these two fields, and this is what this talk is about. I need to start by giving you some definitions. So let me start by defining this local model of distributed computing. So in this model, you have a huge graph on a node, think of internet, and you should really think about each node as being a computer. Now, these computers, they can communicate via, via the links, and they communicate in a synchronous message passing rounds. So everything is very simple. There is no asynchrony. Also, to make everything very simple, we say that the messages that these computers can send can have unbounded size. And also, we do not restrict the computation that these computers are doing. Now, at the very beginning of the algorithm, the nodes know only, let's say, some reasonable per bound on the number of vertices n. And in case of deterministic algorithms, they know their unique identifier. In case of randomized algorithms, each node has a random string. Now, the problems that we are trying to solve are problems like coloring, let's say, proper coloring. And so what we require is that in the end, every node should know its part of output. So if it is coloring, every node should know its color. The measure of time complexity here is very simple. It is just the number of rounds until all the nodes finish. So the model is super simple. Uh, in this talk, we will further restrict our attention to constant degree graphs to make things even simpler. And even more, we will actually restrict our attention to regular trees. So I, I, I should, start the whole talk will be just about regular trees. So I should define what do I mean by a regular tree. So you know this could be an example of a regular, regular tree. It is kind of branching up to that of log n. Uh, also remember, if you are talking about deterministic algorithms, then every vertex of the tree has to have a unique number. This is this unique identifier. Uh, but for me, this is also a regular tree. So in, in general, uh, a regular tree for me is a tree where every vertex has either degree delta or it is a leaf. So we will restrict our attention from now on just to these trees to make things simple. Now, I should also tell you what are the problems that we are going to consider. So here are some examples of so-called local problems. Let me go over them quickly. So maximal independent set is a problem where you need to color some nodes, let's say black, uh, so that the black nodes are not neighboring. And every uncolored white node has at least one black neighbor. So it is inclusion-wise maximal, not maximal. Another example, and this will be the running example uh, in this talk, is perfect matching, where we need to select some edges so that every vertex is matched to a unique neighbor. And proper coloring is another example. This is free coloring, and this is a solution to, to coloring. So in general, local problem is just any problem that you can check the solution locally. Like in two coloring, you can just check that all your neighbors have different color than you have. Uh, one thing that I should make clear is that uh, we somehow don't, in, in my definition of local problems, we will not care about how the solution looks like in leaf. For example, in this perfect matching, you could say that there is no solution to perfect matching if the number of nodes is odd. Okay, that, that's nice, but I don't want to study these kind of global arguments. So better I will say that I don't care about whether these are matched or not. And this is the problem that I'm going to study. So these are local problems. These are problems that we are going to talk about in this talk. And somehow once we have defined the model, once we have restricted our attention to some class of graphs, once we have, once we have restricted our attention to some subclass of problem, maybe we can now hope to prove some interesting theorems. 
And indeed, uh, there is a lot that is known in this particular setup. And this is a result of many papers over uh, several years. And somehow the highlight really, or some, somehow the, the nice thing that we know is that uh, we understand that all the local problems can be somehow uh, partitioned into five different subclasses. So let me now go into these uh, five classes. So first class contains problems that you can solve in constant number of distributed rounds. It doesn't scale with the size of the graph. This class is not very interesting for us. It con contains the, the two simple problems like color everything with color black. This class is already much more interesting. And this is a class of problems that you can solve with deterministic or randomized algorithm in log-star and steps. And prime example of a problem in this class is maximum independence. Next class contains problems that you can solve in log log n rounds randomized algorithm or log n round deterministic algorithm. An example of that of problem in that class would be three coloring. The next class will be most interesting for this talk. And this is the class of problems that you can solve with deterministic or randomized algorithm that has complexity log n. An example of a problem in this class is our example of perfect matching. And finally, there is this final family of classes uh, that contain problems that you can solve in time, which is k fruit of n for some integer k. And one example of a problem in this class is this two coloring problem. So two coloring problem is an example for k equal to one. And that's just because that if your graph uh, looks like the caterpillar that, that we have seen in the pre previous slide, and one end of the caterpillar decides to be colored white, then this information needs to propagate through the whole caterpillar to the, to the other part. So you really need n local rounds until, until you can solve this problem. So again, this top class will not be so interesting for us, or I should, I should by the way say the family of classes, it's not so interesting for us because these problems are somehow a little bit too hard for us. So let me now switch topics entirely and let me talk a bit about this descriptive combinatorics. So th there is no way I can introduce all the relevant mathematics, but at least let me try to give an example of what are the problem that people study in this field. So here is a very specific problem. I give you a square of unit RL and scissors, and I ask you, to cut some constant number of shapes, or cut, cut this square into constant number of shapes, and then to translate these shapes so that they give you a circle of unit area. So is this possible or not? So if your pieces are really cut by scissors and they are somehow nice, then it is not so hard to show that it is not possible. But what if the pieces are measurable? So measurable is somehow a way of saying that they are that the pieces are decent, that we are not somehow relying on some weird axiom of choice constructions. So is it still possible to cut this square into constant number of measurable, meaning decent pieces, and then arrange them to unit circle? Well, it turns out, and it's quite surprising, I think that the answer now is yes. It really is possible. So this is an example of a problem that people study in descriptive combinatorics. And let me now kind of jump to the conclusion. So in descriptive combinatorics, as in distributed algorithms, you can define some classes of local problems. We have seen these five buckets in distributed algorithms, and you can do something similar in descriptive combinatorics. So for example, you can define uh, this class uh, Borel, which would include all the local problems, that you can solve with Borel construction, whatever that means. So let me know I, 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 that there is no way I can kind of define this thing formally, but let me at least give you a way of how you can think about this class of problems. So here is how you should think about it. So you are now given an infinite regular tree, not a finite tree, and you can ask for an oracle that will give you two kinds of constructions. 
So one thing that you can do is that you can do constant constructions. This is really kind of the same as what you can do in distributed algorithms. Uh, the other thing you can do is that you can ask for a maximum independent set. It can also be a maximum independent set on the power graph of the tree, meaning that uh, the selected nodes are farther away than in normal independent set. And if, if you can kind of ask an oracle for maximum independent set finitely many times, and you can do these local O1 constructions, this would actually exactly correspond to a class local log star n, which we have seen uh, a few minutes ago when I was talking about distributed algorithms. But now here comes the difference. So in this class Borel, you can ask for these two constructions, you can do them countably many times. Not finitely many times, this would be distributed algorithm, but countably many times. And this is how we should think about this class Borel. That somehow it's very similar to distributed algorithms, but really the difference is that, you know, in this infinite mathematics, Doing something countable times is actually a very, very reasonable thing to do. And this is why this definition gives you something a little bit different than what we are kind of considering in distributed algorithms. So by the way, this is actually not, we, 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 we are not able to prove that this is exactly the same as the definition of class Borel. As far as we know, the class Borel could include some other constructions. But I, I think you shouldn't care about this. I, I think that this is kind of anyway a nice way of thinking about constructions in descriptive combinatorics. So this is all very interesting. So it seems that kind of these two fields could have some connection because if you kind of translate what these fields are doing, then it seems very similar. And this is something that was realized a few years ago by Bernstein. So he has this, he had this very insightful paper where he kind of formalized some connections between local algorithms and descriptive combinatorics. For example, one thing that he has proven is that uh, this class uh, of distributed, uh, this class from distributed algorithms, class of problems that you can solve in log start and many rounds, is a subclass of these moral constructions. And actually, once you kind of understand how these things are defined, it is actually like pretty simple. So that's all super nice. So, we can kind of draw this picture where on the left we have these five classes from distributed algorithms. These are these five diff different buckets where we kind of know that every problem is in one of these five buckets. And then we can start looking at the classes in descriptive combinatorics. And we can start, you know, drawing all the possible arrows that we can draw. And this is basically the aim of this paper. So here's this, this one arrow that I just discussed that, uh, that Bernstein has proven. And so here is something that we prove in this paper. So there is this other class of constructions in, in constructions in descriptive combinatorics called bare constructions. So again, it has some reasonable mathematical definition, but I don't want to go into this. And one thing that we prove is that this class is actually equivalent to this class of constructions that are distributed and need log and rounds. So I, I think that whenever you find an equivalence between two kind of like different fields, it's always very nice, right? Because it is really going just in one direction, but we really understand now that somehow these two concepts really capture the exactly, exactly the same class of problems. So I now want to give you kind of a glimpse of how a result like this can be proven. So this is the theorem. So actually, in this case, we are kind of lucky because it turns out that both of these classes, that somehow this class of local O of log n or there, has a nice combinatorial description. Somehow we understand very well what makes a problem, what makes a local problem to be included in this class. And here is a definition that kind of captures this combinatorial condition. So it's so so we, we say that the problem is so-called L full. If every two sufficiently far away configurations can be extended to the right solution. So here is what it means. I want to go back to our example of perfect matching. And this problem is helpful. And I want to explain what it means. So suppose I give you some regular tree. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe this is just a small, small part of the tree. And 
I need to invite two vertices here, one here, one here. And I can somehow tell you how, how some, I give you some solution to the perfect matching problem around this left vertex and around this right vertex. For example, I say that I will take this edge to my perfect matching and that edge to my perfect matching. And now I ask you whether it is possible to extend these two partial solutions to a solution on the whole tree. And it is possible. You can kind of take, uh, take edges into perfect matching like this, and then you can extend it to the whole tree. For example, you can do it even if the number of nodes in between have different parity, then maybe the extension will look like this. So the perfect matching has this nice property that we call l full, where this L is some parameter which is kind of telling you how far these two balls need to be distant to make this work. So this property is not matter of course. For example, for two coloring, you don't have this property. If I give you two vertices like this, and I say this guy is colored red, this guy is colored red, and you should extend this to two coloring, maybe it will not be possible because somehow this guy already basically implies how the coloring looks like on the whole tree, and maybe the parity will not match. So this is all very nice because we actually understand that this condition of being helpful is really uh, equivalent to being in this class of local O of Logan, which means that now if you want to prove that the class local O of Logan is equal to the class of bare solutions, we need to prove two theorems. One theorem is that you are in local O of Logan if and only if you are helpful for some L. And the other theorem is that you are in class bare if and only if you are helpful for some L. So fortunately for us, the second part was already proven by Bernstein. So we just proved this first part that uh, whenever you have distributed algorithm of complexity O of log n, it means that you are alpha and vice versa. And to prove this result, we use the technology that was developed by Chang and Petty in their previous work. So unfortunately, both of these theorems are kind of complicated, so I cannot really explain what are the main proof ideas. But instead, I want to give you two examples. One example is that I want to show what is the reason why perfect matching is in this class local O of log n. And the other example is that I want to show you the reason why perfect matching is in this descriptive uh, combinatorics class bear. And these two reasons are actually a little bit different. And this will allow us to uh, have some intuition about what this theorem is saying. So first, let's start with perfect matching. Let's say I want to prove that there is a distributed algorithm for perfect matching that needs just plug and rounds. And this can be proven by a classical technique from distributed algorithms called rake and compressed decomposition. And in this technique, we start with a tree and we kind of uh, mark all of its vertices and we do it by repeatedly applying two things. So the first thing is that we mark all the leaves of the tree. And the second thing that we apply is that we look at the rest of the tree and we erase or mark all of the paths of the, of the tree that have at least some small length. Like here, the length is at least two. So we can start by marking all the leaves at green. Then we look at all the paths. We mark them at blue. Then we again look at all the leaves in the remainder of the graph. We mark them as violet. Then there is no path, but then again, we try to erase these. And finally, this is the, the final we can erase. And then somehow you can prove that after O of log n steps, when you are just repeating these two iterations, you erase the whole tree. So now when you have the decomposition of the tree, you can somehow go from the other side and you can solve your problem. So here is what you do. You start with the with the final leaf that we, that we took out of the tree, and you construct a solution for that leaf, meaning you arbitrarily match it to some of its neighbors. And then you look at somehow the next class on the menu, which are the violet, violet vertices, and you extend the solution to these violet vertices. So these violet vertices, again, match arbitrarily, but you can't really match to somebody who is already matched to somebody. So you continue like this in this fashion. And basically, if you think about it, uh, we are now exactly using the fact that perfect matching is helpful 
to say that the solution can always be extended. So you can continue this extension until the solution is extended to the full tree, possibly except for leaves, but this is, this is fine. This is what we allowed in the definition of a solution to a local problem. So this is how you prove that perfect matching has a distributed algorithm that has log n rounds. Let us now switch a bit and let's talk about what is the reason why perfect matching is in this class there. So this class there, it has very like fr frightening uh, definition that I don't want to go into, but really there is a certain combinatorial construction that is kind of captured by this class that is allowed in this class. And this combinatorial construction is called toast. So let me describe what this combinatorial construction is. So toast is just a linear family of sets, meaning that you have some small subset of vertices like these guys, then you have some bigger subset of vertices that include them like these guys, then you have even bigger subsets and so on. And in this linear family, all of these subsets are finite. So remember, we are now talking about descriptive combinatorics, so we think about an infinite tree. So all of these subsets are finite, and also we can require that all of the kind of the boundaries of these subsets are at least few hops apart. So here, here it will suffice to say that they are at least two hops apart. And this is something that this kind of laminar family called toast. This is something that you can construct in this class there. Also, I forgot to say one very important thing. So we have to require that every vertex is at some point covered by some subset in this family, because otherwise empty family would also be solution. So once you have this, uh, this family of sets called toast, you can again construct the solution to a perfect matching as follows. So you can say that you can first look at the first class. Uh, that's somehow is the smallest, smallest subset in my family. And you can basically uh, give some arbitrary solutions in these small subsets. So for example, this guy is much somehow outside here. Then you take this perfect, this edge here and so on. And because these subsets have some small distance, then these solutions, although they can extend this small subset a bit, they will somehow always be valid. And now, once you have constructed the solution in these, in these small subsets, you can go one level higher, and you can extend the solution that you currently have to these bigger subsets. So for example, one thing that you can do is that you, you now look at all of those vertices that are in, in the bigger subsets, but they are not solved yet, and you again solve them arbitrarily. And again, because perfect matching is l full, it has this l full combinatorial condition, you can prove that the solution always can be extended. And since it can be always extended, you can continue this construction countably many times, right? You, you have somehow this like countable hierarchy where you have still bigger and bigger subsets. And after you do it countable, countably many times in the limit, you cover the whole tree and you have your solution to perfect matching. So this is how you prove that perfect matching is in this class called bar. And as you can see, the two reasons why perfect matching is in local O of log n and why it is in this class there, the two reasons are a little bit different, right? They share some similarities. For example, both are some kind of hierarchical constructions, but they are also a bit different. So this is some countable construction in this class there. We are talking about an infinite tree. Here, this is some finite construction that finishes after O of log n steps. And somehow leaves are important here and so on. So these are really two little bit different construction. And I, I hope that this kind of helps us to kind of appreciate the fact that we now actually understand that the two classes are the same. Somehow this class local O of log n is somehow captured by this Reckon complex construction. This class bear is captured by this a little bit different those construction, but still both of these constructions capture the same class of problems. So I think that this is a quite interesting fact. And let me now move on to some other results that we prove in the paper. So this is what we have seen so far. We have been discussing uh, this equality between local O of log n and bare. 
it turns out that something similar is happening in the lower side of the spectrum. So there is this class called continuous that has, again, some natural formulation that I will not go into. And it turns out that this class of local problems that you can define in this field of descriptive combinatorics is exactly the same as the class of problems you can solve in log star and steps. And this is a result that's waiting for the full version. And it turns out that this is an adaptation of a proof idea uh, that was already taken by Bernstein and independently by Seward and relying on some, it, it relies on some results in descriptive combinatorics that are even earlier. So let me just discuss this thing a bit because when we have been discussing this equality local overflow and equal bear, then we were somehow super lucky because it turned out that all of the problems in this class actually have some simple combinatorial characterization. But it turns out that this is not so in this equality because this thing holds even in a bigger generality. It holds, for example, if instead of trees we consider grids. However, it is known that, that in grids it is actually undecidable to decide whether a problem is in this class or not. So somehow we don't really have a very good, very, very good grip or very good understanding on what makes a problem, uh, what makes a local problem to be in this class, local O of star n. But still, we can prove that the class captures the same problems as this class of continuous solutions. So another reason why these uh, equalities are interesting is that they can also that some stuff was actually reproven in both fields. So there are some results where we know how to prove some, some results in distributed algorithms. For example, that it is undecidable uh, to say whether on grids a local problem is in this class or not. We also know that, that it is undecidable in this class continuous. This was a separate result. And now when we know that these two classes are actually the same, we need just one proof, right? So it actually kind of simplifies the picture. You don't need two proofs for everything. So the picture looks really nice so far. So maybe you are thinking that it could also be the case that this class Borel is the same as, as this class in the middle that allows for fast randomized algorithms. But this is actually not the case. So we prove in this paper that uh, this class Borel is incomparable with this class on the left. And this falls from two results. One is actually, again, earlier result of Marx that implies that there exists a problem that is in this class here, but it is not in this class Borel. And we complement it by an example of a different problem, which is in this class Borel, but it is not in this class R local, local N. So the picture is, is not so super nice that there is you know, really something something new that these descriptive combinatorial classes are are kind of adding. And actually it is even much more complicated than this. So this is the picture from the paper. And you can see here that there is like another another edit that's talking about something called factors of IIDs and uniform algorithms, which is like yet another like subfield that we consider and that we try to uh, link to these other two fields, but I, I really couldn't talk about it during this talk because it would take too much time. So let me just mention that somehow the picture is quite complicated. There are loads of open problems, loads of questions to ask. Also in this paper, we introduce some new concepts like the ID graph trick and prove some new, uh, new results that, that are, I think, interesting, even if you care just about local algorithms or even if you care just about measure theoretical constructions. But again, I unfortunately do not have time to go into that. So let me just finish here. And let me just kind of repeat what this talk was about. So we have seen that there is this model of distributed algorithms in which you can define some local complexities and you can kind of try to understand uh, the behavior of local problem. And then there is this other field uh, called descriptive combinatorics where you can again try to understand local problems, but from a different angle, uh, the definitions are different. But it turns out that there are a lot of connections, and it seems that 
possibly there could be a lot of things waiting to discover or techniques that one can bring from other field to, to, to the, the other one. So I, I think that this is all very exciting. And if you want to chat about it with us, then please contact us. Thank you.